Celebrate what Jesus is doing throughout the nation and rise up to answer His call on your life. To serve the poor, heal the broken, free the captives, and bring joy to those in need. Find hope, encouragement, and motivation through Overcomers TV. This inspiring network features everyday people and ministries across America who are putting God's love in action. Tune in to Overcomers TV on your favorite app or streaming platform. It's time to overcome. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another interview on Overcomers TV Live. I'm Pastor Chuck. I have the honor, joy, and privilege to introduce to you some of our ministry partners and friends. Our next guest, Johan Gauss, Hope Builders Ministries. Johan, thank you so much for joining us today, brother. It's my privilege. Thank you, Pastor Chuck. We've been uh, partners for a very long time. I know you guys have been doing a lot of great work in ministry in Africa. Um, four years ago, we launched the channel Overcomers TV based on 1 John 5, 4. Uh, Whoever is born of God overcomes. This is the victory we have over the world is our faith. So let's talk a little bit about your faith journey. How did Jesus become real to you? And how did that lead to a life of ministry? Well, I, I wonder whether I wonder how many people have had the the situation that i've had i grew up in the church and uh, and i believed that uh, everything was fine with me uh, and then one day i was involved in a motor car cr uh, crash when i was 19 years old um, i shouldn't have lived but there wasn't a scratch on me uh, just the spot where i was sitting in my car was intact it was a little uh, mini minor uh, and uh, it um, it was uh, totally to totaled, and uh, from there on, uh, I realized that I could not trade on the faith of my mother uh, and my father, particularly that of my mother, and uh, that a uh, a personal relationship uh, was entered into when I was 19. Up until then, I read my Bible, I prayed. Uh, but it was trading on somebody else's faith. But I came to the Lord in uh, when I was 19 years of age and entered ministry when I was 31. Um, uh, during the, the, the interim period, I had gone and uh, done a, a, uh, my studies and so on, became an electrical engineer and had an exciting short career in the electrical uh, heavy current electrical engineering world uh, where i built ships and uh yeah. for about 10 years that was and um, then i heard a gentleman by the name of brother andrew also known as god smuggler uh telling what god was doing in countries where people were being killed for their faith Wow. You know, in Southern Africa, I, I was born in Africa. I, I'm a 10th generation African. Um, and so uh, there was there were a number of wars going on, one in Mozambique, one in Zimbabwe, one in Angola. Yeah. And then there were other skirmishes taking place. Um, but I listened very attentively to Brother Andrew and telling how Christians were being persecuted in uh, places behind the Iron Curtain in China, etc. And um, all of a sudden I realized that the faith that Brother Andrew was talking about was not what I was experiencing in my church. Uh, that which I was um, hearing was great. It was the Bible that was being preached, but it was it left me in a position of feeling comfortable and here was a man who was going into those places where people were being killed for their faith. And um, I turned around at that stage. I, I, my wife and I were dating. We were engaged. And I said to a man, this, if this is what this man is experiencing, how God intervenes on his behalf, uh, that's what I want. I really yeah. want to get to know it better. So at that point, uh, Two months later, we got married, but at that point, we joined the uh, prayer group in Durban, South Africa, um, to pray for 
the uh, for the work of Open Doors with Brother Andrew. And um, we were privileged to be in the run-up in Prayer Partners to a project in 1981. Uh, we were still volunteering at that stage before 1981. 1981 came the crunch when one million Bibles were taken into China in one night. Wow. We were part yeah. of the prayer up to that. So anybody who wants to look at to see that, see that. Uh, they can Google like Project Pearl 1981. Yeah. Wow. And uh, well, I saw I saw what God did in that case, yeah. and that just strengthened my faith. Came yeah. on in a full time capacity uh, as a uh, fund developer for the projects for Open Doors, but uh, then very quickly. Um, together with two other guys uh, who heard the call of God to start uh, ministering to the body of Christ in uh, particularly uh, in three countries, Angola, Zimbabwe, yeah. Yeah. and Mozambique. Where the Which body leads of to Christ, Hope Builders Ministries, correct? Yeah. No, that was Timothy yeah. Training Institute. Oh, that was Timothy Training. Yeah, gotcha. That was Timothy yeah. Training in those days. Yeah. Um, and Timothy Training was purely and simply uh, that during the war years, the pastors were all uh, put in jail or scared off or killed. And yeah. so the flock was left behind without leaders. And from 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 came the call. Paul, in the first place, writes to Timothy in the second. That's the second generation. To find faithful men, that's the third. Train them to train others. That's the fourth generation. And Hope Builders is totally structured after Project Timothy and uh, the Timothy Training Institute. I came to the U.S. on a more full-time basis to come and develop uh, the funds here. Um, for many years, I came once a year to come and meet with friends, develop funds for the Timothy Training Institute. But in, uh, in 2001, the Lord confirmed that uh, my wife and I uh, actually transition to the U.S. Now, that was only possible because there were enough indigenous leaders in the countries where we worked that we could concentrate on strengthening them. Three words, three words in the whole right. ministry runs through it from, from, through its core. Number one, equip yeah. the local leaders. Number two, empower the local leaders. Number three, encourage them and let them do the job. They yeah. are so much more uh, ready to do the job faster. They know the local language. They understand the local culture. They understand the pitfalls in the local culture. And they're accepted by the local community. I could yeah. never, never, ever could I get into a position because here, here am I. Uh, I'm working. Uh, yeah, hopefully. birds of a feather flock together is the old phrase that I love. because. Yeah. Yeah. You know, lots of birds, you know, but, you know, ducks with ducks, pigeons with pigeons, you know, name it, seagulls with seagulls. You don't see a mixed batch of birds flying around. And the point is that in just one country like Zambia, there are 72 languages. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there is no way that I could learn all those languages to be there to, to be there for them. But um, by God's grace, uh Africans speak a multitude of languages. Um, and so at this point, if you can work in about 18 different languages, that is in the five uh, sub-Saharan countries that God has us working. If you, we have to work in about 18 different languages there. All I have to do is I have to equip the local leaders and most of those top line leaders that we um, work with do speak uh, either English or French or Portuguese. So right. the big thing is that yeah. our material is either in English, Portuguese or French. That's and then good. they then disseminate it in the local languages. Yeah, uh, and that's for us, we're always talking about evangelism and discipleship and they really go hand in hand. Talk yeah. about that. Okay, well, the model for evangelism that we use is actually uh, 
not what I started out. When when God called us way back in in 1985 to really start the Timothy Training Institute, um, we were busy. It was it, it takes very little. It takes uh, one weekend to plant a church. That's all you need. If you can go to the people and you talk to them and tell them, ask them whether they want a church in their village, because some of them are walking uh, to other villages where there are pastors and where they can get, hear the word, where they can go to church. And they say, well, can we, you mean we can have a church here? And I go, yeah, yeah, we can help you with the church. And they say, but who's, who's going to be our pastor? Well, I don't know. But we very quickly find out who the, the strongest, most mature Christian in that area is. He's most probably an elder that is right. a, from one of the mainline denominations, uh, a, an elder that has been uh, looking after the flock on those uh, under that tree because uh, the mainline, some of the mainline denominations have circuit riders. And they, the missionary gets back to that group once in three months, once in six months. And um, I don't believe you can sustain your spiritual uh, life on a feeding once in three or one, once in six months. So right. the point is, yeah, you can. We will walk the road with you. We will, we've got somebody close by who is uh, trained, who will come over to you, who will work with you. And we get a we did a bunch like that of getting some of the pastors together, and then training them in their own language, close to their own uh, places of um, uh, where they reside. But we had a problem. Uh, in 2010, I threw my hands up in the air and said, "Lord, I cannot do this anymore." Um, we were having. We, have, we had at that stage planted about 35,000 churches uh, in five different countries. It's, it's no problem to plant churches. And you just, if you inspire people to do it, they can do it. But um, we were running into some rather serious problems in the sense that I always, the easiest way to describe it is I, I had become the changer of dirty church diapers. Yeah. <laughs> if anything happens there, they come to me. You right. come to church. And 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 I, I couldn't handle that anymore. Not not in those volumes. I really felt that uh, we were spinning our wheels. And um, I went to the Lord and, and prayed and said, Lord, how on earth, what do, how do we do this? And clearly heard the Lord say, do it my way. Yeah, yeah, that's I good. 27 years of this behind yeah. me. And the second Timothy two verse two, I knew was correct. God had called us to four generations of working. Oh, yeah. And then then uh, I started um, understanding it slowly, slowly. God revealed his plan. Number one, the Great Commission. There are right. four verbs, uh, actually five, but let's just handle four of them. There is the first one go. And the question is, if I get on a plane here and I go anywhere else in the world and I don't do the evangelism, I don't do what God's uh, spreading the gospel of the Lord, am I fulfilling the Great Commission? And the answer is clearly no. Right. Yeah, we live in a culture that says don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. Yep. And people buy into that. You know, they don't want to ruffle feathers. But I'm like, if this topic ruffles feathers, that's the guy you need to be spending your time with so he gets saved and doesn't land where, you know, you know what I mean? So, I mean, but we got into this place where we just like hanging out with other Christians. They're already believers. We're right. holy high five in each other. And, I, you know, there's a time and a place where iron is sharp and iron to hang out in a salt shaker. But salt <laughs> wasn't created to stay in a salt shaker. Anyway, that's my, yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, uh, the salt shaker is rather empty out there in the bush because we don't work yeah, in yeah. Yeah, the cities. Right. There are many missionaries, but there's nobody working out in the rural bush right. where it's totally traditional language. Traditional, the traditions are very strong there, but right. I can go 
without doing God's will. I can baptize re uh, unregenerated people. I can teach people, but if they don't learn, I have not in any of those cases fulfilled the Great Commission. There's one verb that I cannot do without yeah. doing the work, but it's not me. I'm not doing it. The Holy Spirit um, converts a life. They hear the message. We preach yeah. the message. We bring the that which the Lord Jesus came to do for us in his in his life, his death, his resurrection. And uh, then when they come to the Lord, then we start doing the, the operative uh, word in the Great Commission, make disciples. So yeah. that was the beginning. The portal was, I, I saw, you know, wherever you go, make disciples. Whether it be in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or the uttermost parts of the earth, make disciples. That's what happened when the Lord Jesus was on earth. He made disciples and he t they turned the entire known world up by the time uh, uh, 70 after Christ. Uh, the right. historians tell you that at that point, everybody knew who, who Jesus was. So that was the beginning. That was the first uh, tether that I pulled on or that the Lord showed me. And then uh, he showed me, right, okay. The Lord Jesus himself had 12 disciples, but he exactly. poured um, his, his uh, whole life on Peter, James, and John. Yeah, I just taught on the transfiguration last week, and I always bring out this, but this is brilliant. Keep going. Peter, James, and John, the inner three. Yeah. But uh, now here, here's the question, uh, Pastor Chuck. <clears throat> Why was he spending three uh, pouring so much of his time into three of them, uh, whether it be to the raising of Jairus' daughter, whether it be uh, to the Mount of Transfiguration, whether it be to Gethsemane, uh, all over you find that these three are the guys that he he imparts his life into. Right. And uh, something happened when I read that in the scriptures that the Greeks came to Philip and they asked Philip, we want to meet Jesus. Now, he was a disciple. He could take them to Jesus, but he didn't. He goes to Andrew. Why? What was the reason for him going to Andrew? And, and I'm speculating. I, I am open about it. I'm speculating. The point here is that in my, in my run up to this whole thing is if there are Peter, James and John, then whose job was it to tell the other nine what happened at the Mount of Transfiguration? What happened at the raising of Jairus' daughter? What happened at Gethsemane? Whose job was it? And it, in this instance, it seems to me like it was the job of these three. Now, exactly. each one of these three, each had three, then you would have three, and you would have nine and you would have your 12 disciples. Right. Right. Now, it holds good when, when Philip goes to Andrew. Let's just say Andrew was the more senior. He was the leader. So Philip goes to the leader of his triad. And uh, the two of them then take the Greeks to Jesus. Okay. It holds good. But what floored me in the end, because I'm an engineer and I, I am a mathematics numbers man, uh, I really, there were a couple of other things that I'm not going to go into now, but, but the one that really got me was this. Remember, I started out by telling you that God called us, Paul writes to Timothy, find faithful men, teach them so that they can teach others. There are the four generations of evangelism. If you take the one on three disciple making model and you take it through to the fourth generation, here's what you've got. First generation, three. Second generation, nine. Third generation, 27. Fourth generation, 81. Yeah. Here's the significance of that. When the, directly after the ascension, the Bible records that all the disciples were together in one place, and there were 120 of them. Three plus nine plus 27 plus 81 
120 on the spot. Yeah, amen. No coincidence. God's got a book called Numbers. He He's into the numbers. Uh -huh. Even the Pay It Forward movie that came out, Pay It Forward, was yes. to do something for three people that couldn't do something for themselves. Right. And if right. each one of them did it for three people, it's just, it is, it's multiplication. And I've always heard it said that the devil's into division, but God's into multiplication. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's for sure. God's into the multiplication world, and he tells us yeah. to be to be fruitful in that's more good. senses than one. And Amen. So we've we got about 10 minutes left, and that's why we do this show, because, again, it's guys like you, boots on the ground, in the bush, and equipping yep. those in the bush, ministry leaders. It still takes resources, prayer support, financial support, volunteer opportunities. I know you're getting Bibles in their hands, too. Talk about ways people can partner and get involved with Hope Builder Ministries. Okay. Well, I've just returned from Zambia uh, a week ago. In fact, my wife is still in Zambia training women. Uh, she's still going to be there for another two weeks. And uh, so uh, we need uh, prayer support tremendously, uh, strongly there. You know, uh, when, when she is out there in the bush, I'm out there. I took three members of our local church with me this time to immerse uh, them into the ministry. Here is the first thing that I would be very open to your people to pray for. Um, I am 73 years old, um, and uh, I am starting to slow down. I've just, uh, a month or three ago, been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, but uh, it, that's not slowing me down at all. By God's grace, uh, nobody knows how it is that I, I'm able to have the, the, the uh, energy and, and everything to continue going the way that he has allowed me to go. And uh, I'm planning my next year's summer trip. So, uh, but I am bringing in people to go with me as I've done in the past. Right. So there's always the chance of going to actually go and meet some of these leaders on, uh, on the ground. There may be somebody who says, you know what, God's called me to, to work in, uh, in a closer uh, ministry. I am talking to a young man right now. Um, but we need some younger blood in our organization. So there may be somebody, if they want to call me, I, I'll walk them through it. But on a ministry level, I've just, uh, in the beginning of this year, delivered 20,000 Bibles into, uh, into the English ones that were printed particularly for uh, Hope Builders. In fact, if I look at my at my bookcase i may be able to pull one out here because it's got a distinctive cover um i should have done that before i came on the air um it's okay so the the point is that we we print bibles we our printing materials i had to uh, print uh, just over thirty six thousand modules of training modules this year um and that my my budget for that um i mean just for the Bibles and literature is uh, has a budget of a, somewhere around one hundred and fifty, one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and then the local language Bibles are more expensive than if we get the license to print them here. Um, but uh, so there's the, that. But uh, our structure on the ground is very shallow. Uh, there's no huge hierarchy. Um, we have the uh, students, then we have our, our hub leaders, our um, district leaders, and then the regional leaders. Regional leaders are, are guys who are working on a very much wider basis. And because the, um, the uh, public transport out there is pretty bad, uh, yeah. we supply them with motorcycles. A motorcycle costs me some to get it all done somewhere between 25 hundred and three thousand um right. then uh bicycles bicycles uh we're now onto it there is a heavy duty bicycle called the buffalo bicycle that one is about three hundred dollars uh and then uh the bibles so it's bible uh training modules bicycle, motorcycles and then uh, I've just this yeah. year I had to replace the um, the van 
that uh, 12 seater van uh, that gets uh, our groups that go over there. Uh, I had the other one had about 400,000 miles on it when it decided that wow. it was going to die. That's so, a lot. Yep. Yep. Over those yeah. roads. <laughs> yeah. That too. Yeah. They're not nice paved roads that we have here in the States. So, oh, yeah, that's God's wife. grace, but still things need to be replaced. Even 40 years in the desert, those yep. sandals didn't wear out, but they got a new pair of sandals, I'm sure, when they got in the promised land. <laughs> yeah, my wife actually, uh, she traveled from from uh, Chingola to Kasama, and uh, the road is so bad that that trip took 17 hours. Wow. Going through one pothole after the other. Otherwise, you just break your... The right. uh, shock absorbers and the and the yeah. uh, the springs and stuff. Amen. We have a few minutes left, and I noticed the ECFA Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. That's a good housekeeping uh, for financial stewardship. So good. You guys are really good stewards with your time, your treasure, your talents. Um, yeah. I'm glad we're friends, and the legacy and and the seeds that you're planting is good seed. Well, our constitution says that we will never use more than 10% of the incoming funds for uh, administration and development. And last year, we dropped that figure down to 8%. We used 8% of it. 92% was actually going directly into our people uh, on the ground. Uh, so it's, um, yes, we run a lean, lean machine. Um, and uh, I wonder, uh, Brother Chuck, one day when I am in glory, I wonder whether the question will be answered. Um, the growth of uh, Hope Builders Ministries is, is, is beyond that which any man can do. And I have an idea that God blesses those who are faithful. I have an idea that the fact that faithfulness in our uh, spending of his uh, resources. You know, the Bible tells us that the uh, resources, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord, but each one Amen. of those is registered in some farmer's name, and God right. has to speak to him to sell some of those cattle. Now, he also owns the hills. He owns the hills, too. I heard a preacher once uh, say. Yep, that's right. He <laughs> does. But, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, we, we're, we're, we're beyond blessed. Uh, God is really undertaken for yeah. us um, and uh, we're now by God's grace and a, and a congregation that had uh, uh, an interest in um, India uh, and asked whether we would help them to expand in India so we're now working in uh, three provinces in India as well and that is just absolutely yeah. incredible what's happening there amen amen well we're gonna have to have you back on uh, it's a quick. It's amazing how quick a half an hour flies. We could talk forever, but I would love to close in prayer. I'm going to ask you to lead us. I'll close and let's pray together with our viewers. Ask for some partnerships and wisdom moving forward. Sound good? All right. You want me to pray first? Yes, sir. Thank you, Father. I thank you for your grace and mercy for Brother Chuck and his staff, and I pray, Lord, that through this medium that you have. You allow us to talk to people that we have never met, that you would work in their hearts in a manner that will bring glory to your name. I pray, Father, that in all things you may move sovereignly in and through each one of us, whether we hear this message or whether we are already part of it, that we may do that which you call us to do, in a way that will further your kingdom work on this earth and that the people in the bush of africa and in the three provinces in india that uh, that they will hear the gospel and that they will multiply according to the plan that you gave us and we do so in the name of our lord jesus christ with thanksgiving amen Amen. I too thank you, Lord, for time again with Johan. Thank you for our partnership in the gospel and the segments we produce that still air uh, on Overcomers TV. And I thank you for this te technology to bring them in live and get updates. And again, just focus on you and how you did it uh, as a model for the way we ought to do it. 
And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that uh, you give us wisdom and insight in the way you whisper in our ear. Do pray for Johan's wife as she's still in Zambia. We saw the Facebook pictures. Pray blessing over her and their travel back and forth. And again, even the succession plan, just like Moses, you raised up Joshua to take thank over. Um, Lord, we just pray for wisdom, knowing that uh, if you still tarry and uh, we're not here when you come back, Lord, that you have a plan and people will come in and pick up where we left off and to continue to take these ministries to the next level. Thank you for the opening of the doors in India as well as Africa. And we know there's still the, as you taught us, Lord, you said, look unto the fields, they're white unto harvest. Laborers are few, so we're praying to you, the Lord of the harvest, to raise up laborers and workers, people that are willing to go and those to support those that are going. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good stuff, brother. Well, I know you know where your camera is. We'll do a little fist bump at the end there. Um, Got it. Amen. Amen. Boom. That's awesome. <laughs> I would say, be careful. Don't break the cameras. They're expensive. Yeah, well, that's my wife's camera, not mine. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're going to close out with a little 82-second video that we did for Four Corners Home for Children here in Farmington, New Mexico. Hopefully, when you come into town, too, you can stay with us here on campus. And uh, Thank you. Sounds good. Until our next episode and interview on Overcomers TV Live, may you and your families be blessed. Thanks again, Thank Johan. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. In 1953, Jack Drake set up a borrowed tent on donated land just west of the Navajo Nation. There, Four Corners Home for Children was born. Since then, over 2,000 children have passed through our doors, and there is always room for more. Our House of Hope offers shelter to children in crisis. The House of Faith is a long-term home where children can grow and thrive. Our House of Grace provides life skills training to older teenagers as they work toward independence. The Four Corners Academy for Excellence provides educational opportunities in an environment conducive to learning. Navajo Nation Outreach provides for the needs of the Navajo people, addiction recovery, food distribution, providing Bibles in the Navajo language, Four Corners Home for Children, serving in Navajo land since 1953, a place for children to call home.